All right, well, welcome everyone. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on constructing an effective rehabilitation approach to address common manifestations of COVID-19. My name is John Talfik. I'm a senior manager of clinical services with ACP, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Amy Hobbs, national business leader for clinical operations with ACP. We will be today's speakers. This webinar is part of a series that we launched back in April in order to provide support for our partners in a post-acute rehab settings. This webinar will last for approximately 45 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, but we'll try to keep it to about 45 minutes. Thanks, John, I appreciate it. I really appreciate everyone who's joined us today to talk about this important topic of really providing the best possible rehabilitation in the murky waters of COVID-19. You know, this crisis has been with us for six months, and it's, it's especially hit the skilled nursing facility industry very hard. Um, and we're working right now with less information, less guidance um, regarding exactly what the course of uh, illness will be, but also the course of rehabilitation will be for these individuals. So as we go through today, really the intent of this presentation is to kind of wade through the noise of what's been going on. I know you guys have been bar bombarded by a number of different updates, whether it's um, on mitigation strategies to, to control the spread in skilled nursing facilities or the regulatory environment that has a variable impact from federal to local to state government. Um, and all of that is a lot to keep up with. And so the intent here is just to kind of crystallize some of what we know now about COVID-19 and its impact on bodily systems, and then use that information to help um, guide a rehabilitation approach that's going to be most meaning meaningful to the clients that we're caring for. Um, and this is important because um, as we're all going through this together, we want to make sure that patients are receiving the essential services of rehabilitation delivered the best level of care to provide you know the best outcome we don't have a lot of data as i said our, our understanding of this di uh, disease is still emerging um, where possible we certainly did look at the literature to con consider what has been already documented from the experience in europe and china where they had or earlier impact and are further along in the rehabilitative recovery process. We'll also be looking a little bit about um, at some predicate diseases like MERS and SARS and the conditions of acute, dis acute respiratory dist distress syndrome that requires intubation and ICU stays. All of those can help inform the rehabilitation approach for uh, COVID-19. Obviously, this is a huge topic and we have a very short period of time, so we'll be kind of hitting um, just on some highlights of epidemiology, clinical presentation, the lingering effects of the clinical um, you know, status of individuals that may impact post-acute rehabilitation. We'll also to talk about complications of severe COVID-19 and the anticipated sequela um, of COVID-19 in different bodily systems. We'll also just touch briefly on the impact of isolation for even those that are not directly impacted with a diagnosis of COVID-19. We know that seniors residing in skilled nursing facilities are certainly impacted by isolation and the mitigation effects, um, the, the mitigation strategies that have been used to control the spread. And then we'll shift from there to constructing an effective rehabilitation approach and touch briefly on the acute phase, but really focus on the post-acute phase and how we might construct rehabilitation around the different bodily systems that are impacted by COVID. And then we'll close today with some safety considerations for patient treatment during this public health emergency. So if we'll go on to the next slide. We'll, we'll start just by talking about, you know, why COVID is such a challenge in long-term care. Um, and this is based on some data um, presented by the NIH that has shown that the probability of serious COVID-19 disease is higher in people over the age of 60, those living in nursing homes and long-term care facilities, and those with chronic medical conditions. So right smack in the, um, you know, the, the base of folks that we care for on a daily basis. In a recent analysis of more than 1.3 million laboratory-confirmed cases that were reported in the U.S. between January and May, so the first you know, five months this year, 14% of patients diagnosed with COVID-19 required hospitalization, 2% were admitted to the intensive care unit, and five died. 
The mortality rate was definitely most impactful in the older adult population, um, in those over the age of 70 years, regardless of chronic medical conditions. But we can see within the data set that, that where um, health conditions have been reported, there, there is a comorbid state that makes us more, that makes um, an individual more likely to have severe COVID-19, um, an experience with COVID-19. 32% had cardiovascular disease, 30% had diabetes, 18% had chronic lung disease. And that will certainly inform the rehabilitation approach and also the outcome. Um, and so, you know, our patients are going to present in their post-acute COVID recovery phase with some pre-existing conditions potentially of cardiopulmonary and metabolic diseases that will um, play, play a part, have an impact in the rehabilitation pro process. I think by now we're probably all well familiar with the uh, clinical presentation that's typical with individuals that have COVID-19. This includes cough, fever, um, muscle aches and pains, chills, fatigue, headache, and shortness of breath. We can kind of look at the three issues of fever, cough, and shortness of breath as the, as the triad that are most common with um, COVID-19. And in fact, 45% of patients report all three of those typical signs and symptoms together with the likelihood that you have all three increasing with age. And so 56% of people over the age of 65 have all three together. It'd be one thing if these were just temporary during the time of that active infectious disease, but we see the lingering effects of COVID-19 well beyond that um, acute infectious uh, phase. In a follow-up assessment done in Italy, a mean of 60 days after the onset of the first COVID-19 symptoms, a high proportion of the individuals still reported fatigue, dyspnea, joint pain, and chest pain. And this is significant for us as rehabilitation professionals in post-acute care because these certainly will play a part in the willingness and our ability to engage our patient in meaningful rehabilitation. Um, so we're going to have to take into account the fatigue, the shortness of breath, the joint pain, and work to minimize those as we work to get function improved through some of the um, different interventions we'll talk about later. We also see, beyond the typical symptoms we just talked about, complications of severe COVID-19 that really have a big impact in the rehabilitation course and the need for rehabilitation now and well into the future. The most likely early complications are acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, A-R-D-S, and sepsis, septic shock, multi-organ failure, acute kidney injury, and cardiac injury. COVID-19 patients that are admitted to the ICU with ARDS may experience one of three um, associated syndromes, critical illness uh, polyneuropathy, or CIP, critical illness myopathy, or CIM, and post-intensive care syndrome. Critical illness polyneuropathy can affect about up to 46% of patients with ARDS hospitalized in the um, ICU. The hallmark of CIP is generalized weakness that is symmetrical, distal more than proximal, but it does also affect the diaphragm and um, can cause diaphragmatic weakness, which can then lead to difficulty weaning from mechanical ventilation. It's also associated with distal sensory loss, atrophy, and decreased or absent deep tendon reflexes. We also see with CIP pain, loss of range of motion, fatigue, incontinence, dysphagia, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and cognitive loss. CIM, uh, critical illness myopathy, is similar in presentation to CIP, but with more proximal than distal weakness and sensory preservation. And this can occur in up to 48 to 96% of ICU patients with AR ARDS, but is more associated with individuals who've had treatment with corticosteroids or paralytics or who've had sepsis. And so if, if those, um, those interventions have not been part of your patient's ICU stay, they may be less likely than what we list here to be um, impacted by CIM. And then post-acute care syndrome is a separate syndrome associated with reduced pulmonary function um, of the restrictive pattern, reduced inspiratory muscle strength, poor knee extension, poor upper extremity and grip strength, and low functional capacity. So again, the severity of these conditions that we see associated with severe or acute respiratory distress syndrome really kind of underscores the need for rehabilitation that we're seeing now, but also as a consequence long term. Um, as of today at one o'clock when I looked, um, we are over 5 million cases um, documented as positive in the U.S. for COVID-19. 
Of that, about 165,000 people have died as a result of COVID-19. That leaves a wide population that have um, recovered but may be experiencing post-COVID um, symptoms that will require intervention with rehabilitation therapy. So to go into the anticipated sequela of COVID-19, certainly the pulmonary condition is going to be um, of tantamount focus. Um, among over 70,000 persons with COVID-19 in China, 81% were cases that were reported to be mild. And by this, um, by this definition in this study, it was no to mild pneumonia. 14 were present. 14%, excuse me, were considered severe, defined as dyspnea, respiratory frequency of greater than 30 breaths per minute, pulse oxygenation of less than 93%, and or lung infiltrates greater than 50%. And then 5% were critical, defined as having respiratory failure, septic shock, and or more multiple organ, dis, uh, organ dysfunction or failure. Um, so acute respiratory distress with severe hypoxia is is estimated to um, impact about 17 to 30% of patients with clinic clinical deterioration following milder symptoms of COVID-19. And the longer term uh, effects of ARDS may include shortens of breath and pulmonary fibrosis, presenting with restrictive patterns of breathing. And that will certainly be something that we need to fold into our mindset as we engage with folks, folks who are post-COVID um, and we're treating in rehabilitation. Beyond the pulmonary system, the car cardiac system can be impacted. It's um, estimated up to 20% of individuals who have had, um, who have been hospitalized with COVID-19 may have cardiac injury associated with their illness. These presentations can include arrhythmia, cardiac insufficiency, ejection fraction declines, uh, troponin 1 elevation, and severe myocarditis with re reduced systolic function. And um, so that, that presence of cardiac injury and the associated comorbidities will have to be taken into account too as we consider that post-COVID patient and their rehabilitation uh, pro process. Neurologically, um, it is, it's been shown that acutely, 36% of patients with COVID-19 develop neurological symptoms, including headaches, disturbed consciousness, seizures, absence of smell and taste, and paresthesia. From a cognitive perspective, um, all areas of cognition can be impacted, including attention, visual spatial abilities, memory, executive function, and working memory. This not only complicates the rehabilitation process, of course, but it does require, in some circumstances, intervention by rehabilitation therapists to address those and cause a full recovery, not just of physical symptoms, but of those cognitive effects as well. As we go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, dysphagia. We, we mentioned earlier that a consequence of um, some of the acute um, uh, respiratory distress syndromes included dysphagia, um, but even if we don't have um, prolonged uh, um, ICU stays, mechanical ventilation and prolonged intubation can cause increased um, incidence of dysphagia and voice impairments that may require intervention from a speech language pathologist to recover. Um, looking at the integumentary system, we've all heard of COVID toes. We know that there is um, emerging evidence that there is a vascular component of, um, of COVID-19 that is generally associated with uh, coagulopathy, and that can manifest itself as skin conditions, um, whether it's rash, uh, erythema. In a single Italian study, 20% of the confirmed COVID-19 patients developed continuous manif manifestations. And we looked at just beyond that coagula coagulopathy concern and the incidence of um, you know, true integumentary manifestations of COVID, we also see that there is gonna be heightened risk of pressure injury because of reduced mobility when we have mechanical ventilation or just prolonged bed rest as someone recovers from a milder case of COVID-19. And then lastly, on the musculoskeletal front, muscle atrophy and loss of muscle mass starts during the first week of ICU admit admission. We can see other musculoskeletal complications, heterotropic um, ossification, um, muscle wasting, pain, weakness. And this is certainly not isolated just to those that have ICU admission, but those with general, again, bed rest or decreased activity because of a um, diagnosis that you know, knocks them down for a period of time. 
If we switch gears a little bit away from the direct impacts of COVID-19, we have to consider the impact of isolation as it relates to the patients that are residing in skilled nursing facility overall. In a letter to the editors at the Journal of American Medical Directors Association, a PT Gustafson um, you know, wrote, older adults at the greatest risk for mortality from COVID-19 are also at greatest risk for functional decline as a result of mitigation effects to control the spread of COVID-19 in post-acute care settings. So the very challenging decisions that have been made to keep this population safe, we have to ensure that the, that the cure is not worse than the illness, that we don't lose sight of the fact that those individuals that are in quarantine, that are in quarantine-induced restrictions in physical activity and mobility can certainly experience a lot of deleterious consequences. Muscle disuse atrophy, contractures, pain, skin integrity compromise, urinary incontinence, and reduced independence with functional uh, mobility and ADLs as well as increased falls and fractures. So as we think about COVID-19, our focus today is gonna to be on that rehabilitation um, for COVID for patients who have had COVID-19 or recovering from COVID-19, but we'll also keep in mind our rehabilitation efforts for those that have experienced isolation. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John to talk to us about um, constructing an effective rehabilitation approach to COVID-19 manifestations. So John, thanks for taking it over. Thank you, Amy. So yeah, so as Amy mentioned, um, we'll look at the rehab guidelines after COVID, which to no surprise, given the multi-system nature of COVID-19, that's one of the things that makes it unique compared to other common respiratory viruses. Um, it impacts wide range of systems as Amy highlighted in these slides. So each patient should really be fully assessed by a multidisciplinary team and a suitable treatment would be developed for that patient. Uh, the direct impact of COVID-19 on the individual's body system, its sequelae, existing comorbidities will certainly inform that treatment plan. Um, so it does speak, especially of the numbers that Amy talked about, of how paramount and important the role of rehab will play in the recovery and rehab of COVID-19, not just in the immediate time frame, but certainly in the future. Uh, the discharge destination is also very much impacted um, and the estimated discharge date will be very much impacted by the level of involvement for that patient and will influence that plan of care. So one of the things that is part of any effective rehab program, and as the saying goes, what gets measured gets done, um, is being able to measure the baseline for these patients as they are admitted or starting a rehab program. APTA and in collaboration with the specialty sections and academies just recently put together uh, this outcome measures recommendations for post COVID patients. Uh, it specifically highlighted five different domains. So function, strength, endurance, cognition, and quality of life and recommended and named specific outcome measures for each of these domains to be used for patients post COVID. Now, a couple of things to mention about that. All of these outcome measures are publicly available, so they're free to use and to, uh, to integrate into your rehab. There's no fees in order or rights for use, if you will. Um, they're intended, even though they are developed and suggested by APTA, they are intended for the use by cross um, multiple disciplines. So PT, OT, and speech certainly, among other disciplines. And I'm aware of efforts to integrate them into EMRs, electronic medical records. It is worthy to note that all of these, perhaps with one exception, all of these outcome measures are easily viable to be administered in the patient's room. Uh, that one exception is perhaps gate speed. It's a four meter uh, test, so it's approximately 13 feet. So it's likely to make that a little bit more challenging to apply in the patient's room. Uh, but all the other tests and measures are ones that can be incorporated or administered in patient's room um, and certainly are recommended at least on admission and at least at discharge. But obviously somewhere in between the course of rehab is also recommended to assess for, um, for the effectiveness of that rehab program. One final note, a score of zero is certainly very meaningful because it, even if the patient is unable to participate or take part in that outcome measure, uh, 
it provides for at least the baseline to show future progress from that point. All right, so what does a rehab program look like? In the acute phase, um, and this may sound very obvious, it's assess and closely monitor vital signs. That's certainly important for all rehab programs, but certainly in the acute phase and certainly with patient population that has such taxing or um, such distress to the respiratory and cardiac system, uh, it becomes paramount to monitor these vital signs during rehab activities. Um, some early observational studies have actually cautioned from starting pulmonary rehab program too early because that may actually place a respiratory system at distress or certainly may also disperse the virus um, unnecessarily in that very acute phase. Instead, the rehab activities that are recommended in that phase include things such as postural drainage, bed mobility, activities of daily living, um, certainly breathing techniques and conservation techniques, and overall gentle early mobility. I do have that still image from a five and a half minute YouTube that I encourage you to view after the presentation um, from our colleagues across the pond. So this is out of um, England where they have at, um, ICU physiotherapists uh, in, encouraging patients who are trached, so they're on oxygen therapy, for early mobility. And you can see here, uh, they're utilizing platform type of walker in order to uh, increase the base of support for that patient and accounts for the fact that it's, they're likely, even their grip, grip strength may be impacted and would otherwise hamper from their ability to use that support for early gait. In addition, one of the limiting factors, that particular patient that the image is taken from, was asked the question, what was your most limiting factor? Is it your shortness of breath or do you feel your legs are weak that you cannot continue walking? And the patient referenced the latter. So weakness um, very much is a, in addition to respiratory distress, um, is a factor for uh, limiting the ability to engage in rehab. Um, but that early mobility is certainly a key component of any acute phase rehab program. By the way, I should add um, that while this is most common in acute care settings, we're obviously seeing that some of these strategies could also be implemented in skilled nursing facilities or post-acute care settings. Given the limited mobility of patients between hospitals and post-acute care settings, in order to mitigate the spread of the virus. All right, in a subacute phase, uh, we're, or in a post-acute phase, looking at it from different programs. First, the cardiopulmonary system um, recommended low-level aerobic exercise. So things could be as simple as standing, weight shifting, uh, marching in place, and level walking, uh, gauging the intensity of that aerobic exercise based on 50 to 80% of the target heart rate or Corvonin formula. Uh, keep in mind, once again, given that population may have underlying cardiac conditions, that if these patients are on beta blockers that utilize things such as the rate of perceived exertion as opposed to just relying on target heart rate. As it's a cycling, upper or lower extremity cycling is certainly of great benefit here because you have the motorized uh, assistance where the patient can engage in interval training. So they're on for one minute and perhaps recovering or recouping for one minute. So some of these interventions can certainly be very valuable in this scenario. Um, I believe this recommendation is out of Stanford Hall consensus statement. Again, there's a, an abundance of research that are been shared early from England in particular. So this one here is one of 36 recommendations on pulmonary rehab where it suggested low intensity exercise of three METs or less. So three times the amount of energy it takes to just sit still and relax, if you will, to be considered as the initial part of pulmonary rehab, particularly for those that are on oxygen therapy and then progress the program based on patient's presentations and symptoms. I also wanted to highlight the fact that even though we don't have that significant body of evidence yet for COVID, there are significant similarities that we can extrapolate from research on patients with COPD and patients with CHF. And this one here is from 2009 chest, magazine, chest article rather that 
uh, researchers concluded NMES showing promising um, results as a possible treatment strategies for those with CHF. The idea here is that you're extracting the greatest amount of muscle strength with the least amount of load on the patient's cardiac and respiratory system. On a neuro program, um, based on given the wide spectrum of presentations for these patients, it obviously very much depends on their presentation. So if they have mild symptoms, such as perhaps a, a loss of the taste and smell senses, uh, these often are reported to resolve far more quickly, as opposed to moderate symptoms with sequelae such as developing TIAs or CVAs during that, due to that coagulopathy issue. So certainly tailoring the treatment approach uh, and the intensity of therapy based on that presentation, but a consensus here in the early going for neuro rehab uh, of post-COVID patients is mobility and functional training. Um, and then once again, there's the consideration of adding uh, or integrating electrotherapy early in that rehab program. Uh, I cited here two forms of ESTEM. One is patterned electrical neuromuscular stimulation. It's a waveform unique to ACP where the pattern mimics EMG firing pattern. So particular influence or particular benefit for patients with neurological presentations, given the fact that it mimics that normal firing pattern of agonist antagonist. So if patients have some sort of uh, either hypo or hypertonicity, that waveform is superimposing their normal firing pattern during functional or movement activity. FES is another form, so functional electrostimulation. And some in our world of rehab may refer that specifically to the image in the bottom here, where electrodes are placed uh, for ESTEM to provide a functional specific or replica of the firing pattern of a given function. Uh, but someone like Dr. Gadalon has always advocated for many years now for really using that term, FES, um, as a unifying term to many of the acronyms that we use for electrostimulation. Because really in many, many examples, the use of ESTEM for neuro rehab is really essentially used in order to improve function, whether that's to address impairment of weakness or to address reducing spasticity uh, or increase in muscle recruitment or in this case, enhance a specific functional activity, all of these ultimately is for the purpose and the goal of increasing or incorporating that into functional activity. Uh, I did cite here a, a guidance from NICE, a National Institute of Care Excellence out of England once again. This is actually a, um, a guidance that myself and a colleague of mine, um, uh, Rich Engelman, were invited as expert consultants uh, to contribute to at the middle of 2019. And just fresh off or hot off the press, I should say last week, that guidance has been published and released um, and recommended for patients who are having acute exacerbation for their chronic conditions and are unable to exercise, um, that there is evidence of efficacy. Um, there, these evidence is adequate to support the use of electrostimulation as part of their rehab. So while they specifically looked once again, at patient populations such as those with CHF, COPD, uh, I thought it's still very much relevant and one can extrapolate the fact that if patients had pre-morbid conditions such as CVA or other neurological disorders, uh, the incorporation of ESTEM is of value for that patient population. Some way, another one here, NMES may be of particular benefit for those with uh, poor functional capacity. Same concept as cardiopulm, where you're able to extract the greatest amount of increase in muscle strength with the least loading onto the cardiac and respiratory systems. Um, once again, as part of neuro rehab, it was, as we've kind of contemplated, what would be a good and effective program to incorporate in, in post-COVID, virtual reality surface right to the top. And, and the fact that it does have um, the added advantage of, uh, you know, a sense of immersion for the patient. So it does counter some of the effects of um, isolation that Amy mentioned in the early going. Um, so if you consider the fact that you can bring a, a screen-based 
virtual reality system into the patient's doorway or even into the patient's room. There isn't really a whole lot of contact by the patient. So from infection control perspective, uh, it provides for a, a very suitable type of tool, but it does take the patient outside of the full four walls of the, of the room into that augmented reality, uh, that distraction, that immersion into this augmented reality um, not only have great benefit of distracting the patient, allowing them to have greater number of repetitions, uh, increased motor learning for patients with neurological conditions, but certainly also bringing them into that environment outside of that um, isolated, um, the sense of isolation, if you will. So I listed two research articles here that specifically explored the use of virtual reality and how when it was added to traditional rehab programs, you can actually see uh, some superior outcomes uh, with the addition of virtual reality techniques. Next program here is on to dysphagia. And again, as a PT myself, um, I know enough to just be dangerous, but more importantly, I know enough to really um, highlight the importance of interdisciplinary and collaborative approach with our SLP colleagues. So for those patients particularly that perhaps were admitted from a hospital uh, and have had any history of, uh, recent history of intubation, early assessment by an SLP to consider any of the complications to their difficulty swallowing or voice impairments. Uh, and certainly even though cognitive deficits is not part of the dysphagia program, it is one of the domains where uh, PTs would collaborate most often with OT and speech colleagues to address these cognitive limits. Uh, limitations. Uh, so the uh, dysphagia program, um, a, a recommended rehab program for dysphagia, would incorporate things such as surface EMG, where you have that nice biofeedback display of muscle movement in a graph or animated format. So once again, not only does have that benefit of visualizing the activity or the exercise, but also has a bit of a, that virtual environment and immersing the, pa the patient into that augmented reality. In addition, incorporating head and neck pens to key muscle groups that contribute to swallowing, proper posture, positioning, and diaphragmatic breathing. Wound healing program. Um, Amy highlighted this as one area that we've come to learn about starting in I would say March, April timeframe, so much so that the National uh, Pressure Injury Advisory Panel issued two white papers in very short order uh, that very much emphasized the importance of differential diagnosis between what is considered a known diagnosis of deep tissue injury and setting that apart and distinguish it from COVID skin manifestations. Those two images that you see on the slide here are from, that, from one of those two white papers. Um, you notice a diffuse presentation of discoloration, um, purple color skin manifestation that is commonly associated with the coagulopathy disorder. So increased coagulation of, um, uh, of as a result of the uh, blood vessels also being impacted by the COVID virus. Um, and Two takeaways from these two white papers and as you consider an effective wound healing program is one, the importance of differential diagnosis and distinguishing those two, a tissue injury versus a skin manifestation. Um, but the second one is to also consider that tissue injury, even in the presence of unavoidable, unavoidable risk factors or in the presence of COVID manifestations, shouldn't be considered inevitable. Instead, those white papers provide clear direction on an effective wound healing program uh, that works to maintain and improve tissue tolerance in order to prevent that injury. Consider the fact that someone could have coagulopathy issues, um, could have skin manifestations of COVID, um, but also as a result of their medical involvement with COVID, they also have overall decreased mobility. Uh, they also require repositioning in bed very frequently. All these factors would actually may predispose them to not just having one of these issues, but both of them combined. So both the COVID-19 manifestation as well as pressure, pressure and shear injury.
So treatment strategies such as positioning off any redness, um, turning them more frequently or if unable to do so, using greater higher level support surfaces, avoiding medical devices that would uh, increase risk of pressure injury, such as a bedpan, um, and offloading appropriately uh, for surfaces and turning schedule. Um, you can also consider using high volt pulse current electrotherapy or subthermal shortwave diathermy. Now, I know there's always a question about the coagulopathy as an underlying issue, but certainly the recommendation is if the patient is at a therapeutic level of PT INR, perhaps consulting with the physician to see if using some of these biophysical agents would be appropriate in order to enhance tissue healing or improve tissue tolerance as well. And then finally, the last program that I'll mention here is musculoskeletal. Um, there is an estimated 3% loss of muscle mass on daily basis with hospitalization. So you can imagine even with an average stay of seven days, uh, a patient could lose upwards of 20% of all their muscle mass. This is often referred to as ICU acquired or hospital acquired muscle weakness. Uh, there's also another observational studies out of the University of California, San Francisco that reported, no surprise to anyone, reported significant drop in physical activities, not just in the US, but globally. Uh, they estimated approximately 50% reduction in the number of steps that are collected from devices such as Fitbit or Apple Watches or whatnot. Um, so this certainly may have deleterious health effects uh, and as such recommendation of incorporating increased physical activity that are in alignment with the physical activity guidelines uh, for adults or those adults with chronic conditions the recommendation, as you recall, is 150 to 300 minutes of weekly moderate intensity physical activity or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous activity on a weekly basis. Now, for those with chronic conditions or disability that cannot participate in such rigorous schedule, uh, the recommendation is to at least avoid inactivity and do as much activities as possible. Uh, as part of that recommendation of incorporating progressive resistive exercise um, at a high or moderate intensity. So instead of using a one rep max, consider using a number of reps to fatigue. So moderate intensity is 12 to 20 repetitions before fatiguing, or a high intensity is eight to 12 repetitions before fatiguing. I did list here a recent CPG clinical practice guideline that was just issued recently by APTA. Uh, Diane, Jetty, and colleagues uh, cited strong evidence for motor function training, so balance, walking, movement symmetry, um, specifically to total knee arthroplasty patient population. I know that while in COVID we've seen virtually elimination of all elective surgeries and total knee arthroplasties, we're seeing some return to that. But I also felt that extrapolating this evidence to patients with osteoarthritic changes is worthwhile to list here and to consider. Uh, that same clinical practice guideline also recommended with moderate intensity, the use of NMES for key muscle groups, as well as resistant inten resistance and intensity of strengthening exercise. Now, an added benefit to progressive resistive exercise um, to that musculoskeletal system is also the fact that it does have the ability to significantly reduce depressive symptoms among adults, regardless of the health status, total prescribed volume of resistance exercise, or any significant improvements in strength. So if nothing else, and if you don't extract any additional value from a progressive resistive exercise program, um, there's certainly evidence to suggest that it does have some positive impact on reducing depressive symptoms. So once again, I know we have not talked about mental health as an isolated or as a, uh, as a standalone program or a clinical area, but it certainly there is a lot of side benefits for a progressive resistive exercise program to mental health benefits as well. All right, so in summary, and before I pass it back on to Amy, uh, while we may not have necessarily shared any unique COVID-specific rehab pathways, much of what we shared is similar to many geriatric rehab programs, uh, but certainly with the widespread and the prevalence of post-COVID, it certainly highlights the paramount and important role that all of you play today 
and I suspect will play in the, in the months and years to come uh, to take part in an effective rehab program for this population, especially that impacts the geriatric population the most. So with that, um, I will pass it on to Amy to discuss safety considerations for patients as part of our rehab program. Great, John. Thanks so much. And we should really look at that segment as a digest version of what interventions may be appropriate for the post-COVID patient. This is a difficult topic to really do justice to just from an etiology perspective and the sequela, but also the intervention. So understand that for each of those slides that John just went through, um, ACP has resources programming that is interdisciplinary that will flush that out um, and broaden the depth and breadth of the understanding of that, of that topic. But as John said, you know, good geriatric rehabilitation principles applied for the impairments that are identified by that individual, by individual basis post-COVID is really the key to constructing a, an effective treatment program. Um, and so, you know, one of the guidance, guiding principles for us is first do no harm. And so it is so important that we stay safe as we provide these interventions to patients both cl cl clinician, keeping themselves safe from potential exposure um, to COVID-19, but also pre preventing the spread between patients. And so CDC has issued some guidelines specifically for environmental infection control as it relates to SARS-CoV-2 um, virus, that, that, which causes COVID-19. Um, and you know, the guidance rightly does direct that dedicated medical equipment should be used when caring for patients with suspected or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. That makes a lot of sense. It goes on to say, though, that all non-dedicated, non-disposal medical equipment, much of which we would say is, is what we would utilize as our tools of the trade and rehabilitation, that type of equipment used for patient care should be cleaned and disinfected according to manufacturer's instructions and facility policies. It's really important that we consistently and correctly apply disinfection and cleaning, and if we do so, we can keep ourselves and our patients safe. The, EP, the um, CDC goes on to say that routine cleaning for, and disinfection procedures are appropriate for SARS-CoV-2 in healthcare settings, including those patient care areas in which um, aerosolized procedures are performed. So if we go to the next page, we'll kind of um, just kind of walk through what our traditional guidance has been and some modifications that we've made in light of this COVID-19 pandemic. So from a routine cleaning perspective, um, we recommend that you clean your equipment daily in between patients with ACP germicidal wipes. And that just means taking a germicidal wipe, wiping down the common contact surfaces, such as the control panel, the lead wires, and allowing it to air dry. And that technique is sufficient to remove organic material and will inactivate most bacteria and viruses. With any treatment and with any cleaning, whether it's routine or, or intermediate level, which we'll talk about next, remember that disposable components, reusable electrodes, single-use electrodes, they're for individual patient use only and should not be used on multiple patients. Certainly with um, COVID-19 and our desire to keep um, patients safe between, uh, between sessions, um, we have talked about intermediate level disinfection a lot. And so in, in doing intermediate level of disinfection, this has traditionally been something we recommended when there is a high likelihood of contamination by the device with physiologic fluid. And so in the past, we've really recommended this predominantly with um, post, with wound healing treatments and with uh, incontinence treatments. With COVID-19, the risk and the concern about respiratory droplets getting um, in contact with the device is of heightened concern. And so we would recommend intermediate level disinfection for COVID-19. First then, we'll ensure the device has been cleaned after the last patient encounter. Uh, don PPE per your facility code protocol for the specific treatment you'll be doing. And then when we include in our intermediate disinfection, level disinfection guidance, the use of barrier films, the, the goal, the intention is to provide protection against device contamination by physiologic fluid. Um, so in, in many respects, we've traditionally recommended the use of barrier films or plastic sleeves as shown in the image at the, at the bottom. 
With COVID and respiratory droplets, we can do source control by having both the clinician and the patient wear a mask, and that provides the barrier that will keep that respiratory droplet from getting on the device. There are certainly circumstances in which the patient is not able to wear a mask. It's not clinically or medically supported, or they, they, they can't um, tolerate it from a, a, from a breathing perspective. If the patient is unable to wear a mask, then you should use the barrier films, the sleeves, the sheaths that we show here. Um, to, the, to protect the clinician contact, the patient contact points the device. If we go on to the next slide, we'll talk about, you know, that after you've got it, you know, you've got your barriers in place, whether it's a mask or you've got the barrier films in place, perform the treatment. At the end of the treatment, remove the particular barriers that they've been used. Um, don new gloves and perform an intermediate level disinfection, in which you'll take the wipe, wipe down the device completely and thoroughly, throw the wipe away, take a second wipe, wipe the machine down um, thoroughly, and then leave it to be wet. We recommend five minutes, um, which is well beyond the dwell time that's indicated for SARS-CoV-19, but it ensures that we allow enough time to really inactivate any type of other microbe, bacteria, virus that might be present as well. And then once that's done, it's air dried, um, you're ready for the next patient application. We totally understand. I mean, it's, it's something we, we are experiencing in our personal lives, and our professional lives. Disinfectants are hard to come by. And we've had the same issue with the PDI Super Santa Cloth wipe. It used to be that we could get those in stock and keep them in stock on the, on the regular. That is becoming more difficult. Um, and so rather than you know, requiring that our devices are used with PDI Super Santa Cloth wipe, um, we've recently updated our policy to say, you know, any environmental cleaning solution that is, that is in use in your facility and that is effective against COVID-19 is appropriate to be used with our devices. If you're using something other than the PDI Super Santa Cloth wipe though, please do take note of the dwell time of the product you're using and adjust your, um, you know, your, that contact time in the intermediate level of disinfection for that particular agent. And I've listed for you here um, some common products as well as their dwell time and the EPA registration number. This is a very short list of a very long list that the EPA maintains. And you can find that full list and you can find dwell times for other products at the uh, link that I show there. Um, so the use of disinfection, the use of barrier films, the use of source control with a mask are very important, certainly. Um, there are many ways that we can um, be innovative, and we've seen our customers, our partners be innovative in the field. Um, like John mentioned earlier, positioning an OmniVR in the doorway of a room and having the patient engage with it from within the room. Um, certainly we've seen um, individuals that will place the whole um, Omniverse inside of a Ziploc bag and, and interact with it that way. Um, if you're having trouble kind of constructing a a um, infection control policy that really meets your facility guidelines, but also is reflecting what the manufacturer guidelines is with ACP, please reach out and we'll let us help you problem solve through that and uh, get the safest setup for you specifically and the, um, the facility and the environment that you're in. So with that, um, I think we're coming to the end of our session. Again, this was intended to kind of be um, a, a, a quick synopsis of the research on COVID-19 right now, the implications in post-acute rehabilitation, the uh, rehabilitation initiatives we might implement with patients depending on what their impairments are. And we want to close by just saying thank you so much for your partnership and for your commitment to patient care. You know, we've heard a lot about healthcare heroes, and we applaud all of you that are working in that front line, working with patients, providing the best rehabilitative um, care possible. We want to be part of that uh, solution in, in optimizing outcomes, not only for the COVID positive patient, but those that are um, experiencing isolation in the, in the skilled nursing facility as a result of the COVID crisis. So with that, John, I'm going to turn it back over to you to, to kind of walk us through any Q&A that has come in and to close out for us. Thank you so much, Amy, and thanks for all of you who have joined us. Uh, just a reminder, you can ask questions one of two ways, either type in the Q&A box or you can raise your hand and we would unmute your line to ask your question. Uh, so we do have one question here, Amy, that asked about if we can touch upon the use of OmniCycle with COVID patients, uh, what particular settings on the OmniCycle? So I can, I can take a first crack at this and then pass it on to you for additional comments. So what, one suggestion I would have for this is certainly um, using the neuro rehab uh, 
setting on the OmniCycle with a baseline of motor assist of let's say 15 to 20 RPMs. So what that will accomplish is that the patient is able to actively contribute to exercise while you're following those infection control procedures. Uh, certainly you can use a pulse ox in order to monitor patients uh, oxygen level and heart rate, or you can use a dedicated heart rate monitor that comes with the OmniCycle. And then the instruction to the patient would be, uh, let's say if it was a 10 minute exercise, on even minutes, I'd like you to do as vigorous of exercise as you can while breathing optimally. And then on even minutes, you can allow the cycle to take you for a ride, if you will, um, in order to recover respiratorily. So one minute on, one minute off, it's a type of interval training um, while using the, the motorized assist from the OmniCycle. I think that was well answered. I don't know that I have anything to add except to say that obviously the dose is going to be very dependent upon the patient's baseline status from a cardiopulmonary perspective and what you're trying to achieve in that session. So it's influenced by acuity, it's influenced by um, many things, but I do think I agree, John, that that neuro setting with motor assist is appropriate. It can allow that person to seamlessly transition between active and um, active assisted and continue to progress as you use it, as you use the, the uh, device. Indeed. Um, we have a couple other thank yous and one Requests for additional resources on the effects of isolation provoke depression, certainly an area that I'm sure um, we know some about, but we'll continue to learn a lot more about. But that certainly, we'll put that on our list of uh, topics to conquer in the future. So thanks for that suggestion. All right, so I don't see any other questions in order to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, we'll bring this um, webinar to a close. Thank you, everyone, and take care. Thanks, Thank everyone.